thank you for having me here. It's a real honor. It's an honor to be on uh, Coast Salish territory. Um, you know, and I, I want to talk about a number of things tonight. Obviously, I come out of the labor movement, and um, you know, having said that, I think you know, being in the labor movement, at least the official or mainstream labor movement, because of course, labor isn't just a unionized job. It's you know, people, usually women, changing diapers on babies. It's it's people out walking the streets. It's people trying to find food and shelter tonight. That's labor too, and and uh, those in official labor often uh, forget that. And I'm reminded of that often. And being in the labor movement, too, is also sort of like being in church. You know, you don't speak out of turn. There's things that you can say and things you can't say. And I knew this wasn't a labor meeting tonight because I saw that I was the only white guy on the stage. So I knew for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, and, and you know, labor unions are about contracts, right? And and uh, and of course, contracts again only apply in some places, and others they don't. For example, the Algonquins of Barrier Lake, five hours north of Ottawa, have a contract that's never been recognized, and they suffer for it every day. And if I had more time, I'd unpack that some, at least from my perspective. But I encourage you to, to look into that because contracts are just sort of an illusion. I think the British system was really masterful at. at uh, building in corruption, building in injustice right into a legal order. You know, they like to talk about other countries and other places as being there's corruption in this. Well, here we just legalize it. That's the only difference, and it's continuing on to this day. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, tonight about um, uh, the sort of self-victimization uh, and the workers' struggle, uh, and then also the, the sort of the way that sort of capitalists and workers actually in some sort of perverse ways dovetail, and that's about, it's always about more, isn't it? It's, it's always about we, we want more, or we want a redistribution of wealth. It's sort of like, you know, wanting a piece, bigger piece of the pie without asking yourselves what the ingredients of that pie uh, are. And so, in these times, um, there's, uh, the, you know, we're in a very difficult, I think, an historic period, I think, if we really think about it. Um, and we can't afford to lose time and, um, and, our, and our direction about how we work with each other and how we change rather than mitigate or even adapt to a system that's going to kill us all sooner or later. It's already killing. It's already killed so many, and in the end, it's going to uh, kill a lot more. So I want to talk a little bit about tonight, about in terms of the labor movement, uh, a little bit about um, concept of growth, uh, self-victimization, and uh, a little bit about the Occupy movement and the Commons, and just some thoughts that I have. And um, and so I'll just start by saying, you know, I know that everybody here is in in a labor union, and even those who are may not be familiar with this sort of unspoken arrangement or this, this sort of deal uh, post in the post-war period between, uh, between workers and capitalists. And of course for the capitalists, they're laughing at us. They know it's over. But those of us in the labor movement still keep behaving like there, there's still some kind of uh, uh, a mutual uh, standoff that you know we can work together and we can lobby these people and somehow uh, create incremental increases for workers, which if we look around, for the last you know 15, 20 years, we can see that's just absurd. There's very little going forward, and there's a whole lot going backwards. Um, so part of this is this, this system we have as workers is, is the self-victimization. Um, you know, we're always complaining about the other side. We're always complaining about what they're doing, what they're doing to us, um, usually from a very narrow focus too. And the fact is, is that's what they do, that's what they're rewarded to do, that's what they're paid to do, that's how the system works. So we should just get over that and start talking about ourselves a little bit more and what we're going to do about it, uh, rather than that, that sort of, you know, being the victim of everything that happens. And, uh, but having said that, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, that victim stuff, because I think it's important um, in, in, this, in this context. Um, because, uh, you know, Arthur mentioned resource extraction and that, you know, quest for new lands and new territories, and it's still going on, and, uh, as we've heard tonight. And I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, times, uh, of course, the, 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 um, the, the CEOs in this country, we just take the top 100 CEOs, they've done such a great job in the economy that they're making a 20 had an increase in just in the past year of 27% in wages. Um, so the more they mess over us, the more they mess over our earth, the more they mess over the, the vast multitude of humanity, 
there's even greater and more lucrative rewards for doing that. Uh, you know, they now make 180 times more than the average uh, Canadian uh, wage. Um, you know, and that's grown exponentially in the last uh, you know, 15 years, so not surprising. 46 of the top 100 CEOs um, uh, have a deferred pension plan, uh, which they will average in retirement 1.19 million a year, and that's just from the pension. Or we can take people like Frank Stronach, whose um, uh, salary last year was 61,811,000 and some dollars. Um, and if you look at the top 100 CEOs, one thing that's really startling is you see the amount that comes out of resource extraction. So in fact, they haven't created anything. All they've gone is taken uh, resources out of other lands that, uh, um, that they're not really entitled to, but they'll just take it anyway. And that's where that wealth is coming from. It's not coming from any, any magical thing they've done or created or, you know. I remember there was a guy years ago, uh, I think it was uh, Ken Thompson, I, I believe. I may be wrong with this, but Ken Thompson is dead now. But uh, you know, he at one time was the richest man in Canada. He's a multi-billionaire, and he uh, I said, you know, I don't know what people are complaining about. You know, I worked hard my whole life, and I'm sure, like maybe he maybe did. Well, I mean, a lot of rich people really don't do anything, but there are some I think that do. You know, find at the office on Saturday night or whatever, and he was one of them. And, uh, and so somebody said, yeah, he might. And so he said, you know, I worked so hard for all of this, and I probably didn't even make minimum wage. So somebody did the math and realized, yeah, he was an amazing man, because he would have had work since, like, the 12th century every second. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, that, that we enter into alliances with these people and think that we can lobby them. No, you know, they use us. They, they use all of us, and the, the labor movement's a good example of that. Now, we talk about you know this whole concept of having more and, and all and all of that and and you know there is talk about you know concepts like degrowth and zero growth and uh, that we have to have a different relationship or you know uh, as the Cree say to live life in a good way or as Avo talks about in Bolivia you know to have a good life but even then you know uh, a lot of the you know Bolivia a lot of this there's a lot of mining going on there's still a lot of resource extraction because when you live in a capitalized society it's hard to go it alone because the bastards will crush you they'll just find you and they'll crush you and we've seen that again and again and again so you know it's a pretty um, sort of perverse order that we're living under but there's also lots going on the global economy right now is incredibly explosive it, there's no question about it and there's breakdowns in the ruling class themselves. And my fear is, is that what we're going to see in the coming years, and, and not so far away, in fact, we're already seeing it in some cases, we'll either have a, a, a swift move to fascism, or we'll have, you know, sort of left-wing, social democratic kind of governments who never question the system, right, think it all can be mitigated, who may get into power in some jurisdictions, only to once again, you know, fail everyone, and we, you know, we all get pissed off at them because we didn't see the change that we had hoped to change. Because, of course, we really know that those aren't the people in power. Real power doesn't exist in our legislatures or our parliaments, right? They're in those hidden places. That's where the real power exists. So, um, the power structures, uh, and also in our own unions, have to be, have to be addressed. Because we're a fl reflection of those uh, power structures. So we're, going to, we're in a situation where we have to decide, and I know it maybe sounds a little radical now, or a little, you know, we're a throwback to an earlier time, but we're really talking about revolutionary thinking and what that means, and, and you know, reclaiming that, uh, those spaces around us is revolutionary thinking, or we can go into more compromises, which is just going to prolong the inevitable and, uh, and lead us down the path that uh, I think that most of us here don't want to see uh, in the end. So, if we're going to do this, it's going to take more than just political action. It means taking stuff over. And it means relating to each other and doing that in a new way. And it means talking about that and putting that on the agenda. I, it's the only way that we're going to survive. And so, if we're talking about um, political spaces, or you know, political parties or whatever, let's just throw that out the window. And I think that's, of course, the great thing about the Occupy movement, the Commons, and all this stuff, they're raising a new discourse. But what's Labour's relation to that? Labour's relation is, hey, those kids are doing a good thing. Of course, they weren't talking about it in the first place, you know, until it was in the news media. Uh, 
And then suddenly, this was an important issue for labor. So the contribution mainly of labor is, hey, we'll get you some tents or some yurts or some generators. <laughs> and we really got to be talking about, it's not just the parks that need to be occupied. We've got to get, first of all, we've got, we've got to get rid of their occupation in our own minds. Yeah. And, and I think that's really key. And we can do that if we, have, if we put that into our discourse. But it's also about saying, you know, let's occupy their centers. Let's take their spaces. Let's take those industrial places. Let's take those places of transportation. Let's take those, uh, those spaces where um, that's more than finance, but also the industrial, uh, where the industrial capacity lies, and where things are made, and where they make their money, and where trade moves. And, all that. and we can move, we can shift, we can shake that up. But just lobbying at the political level, saying, you know, we're going we're gonna, to uh, you know, make a point about finance capital or about the politicians is not enough. We actually have to expand those spaces and keep them mobile and keep them moving and take more of them and learn to have a real dialogue. Now, one of my, one of my pet peeves about uh, the Occupy movement, and I, I would say this is unfair. I don't have a pet peeve about it in particular. I think it's a great thing. But the way that we relate inside it, from what, what I could observe, there's still a great deal of male speaking going on in those, those forums. There's a great deal of guys get up and talk and tell us how it is. But another thing too is we get into this notion, we're so, we're so bent on hearing everyone's voice, and that's important because the other side of that is that sort of totalitarian thinking where somebody's going to decide everything for us. But the problem is, is we've become so, so hyper-democratic that, you know, we're talking, it's almost like the equivalent of, you know, you know, I don't know all the smarties, we just take the brown ones out, right? And so we, you know, we, and so we waste a lot of time uh, in, uh, in that kind of, um, you know, identity of I want this and I want that. And that's fine, but we also have to have those spaces of real discussion about how we stop being victims, about how we deepen the struggle and how we actually take that which is around us and change it into something that will serve all of human beings and serve all the earth. Uh, for the better good and for future generations that we've, we've been taught by uh, our uh, Aboriginal um, leaders and, and, and elders and so on that we see that on this land that we are settlers on. And I, I, you know, I do have to say too, as a, as a settler, descendant of a settler, you know, we really got to get past our rhetoric, right? Because labor unions are really great in having now somebody come in and do a smudge. You know, that's something that took like, you know, you know, 100 years of trade unions to finally happen. But then that's the end of it. Right? Oh, that's great. We love you. Now go back home. No. We've got to do better than that. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to those who come after us to do a better job than that. And we recognize this for what it really is. And so we can't just become silent participants by thinking, you know, we say good words, but we don't really do anything that changes anything. Now, this question of fascism. Um, I'm not joking about it. You know, sometimes I mention I think that, that Canada is really a, a, a fascist society and it's becoming more so. And people get this kind of nervous laughter. Oh, isn't that cute? Isn't that funny? But what are the hallmarks of a fascist society? Well, it's corporatism. Did you know the Labour Minister recently said that the economy should be declared an essential service? Yeah. Um, I think Hitler did that too. Um, you know, there's, there's a powerful nationalism. Now they want to celebrate the War of 1812. They want to spend just hundreds of millions of dollars having people run around with bayonets reenacting this War of 1812. Um, identification of enemies is a unifying cause. Well, that's a really good fascist one. No, you know, we, we see that certainly. Uh, certain people are identified and targeted as being uh, that, that we should all live in fear of. Uh, controlled mass media, an obsession with national security. Uh, corporate power, corporatism, labor power is suppressed, uh, and on and on. Disdain for intellectuals and the arts, an obsession with crime and punishment. All of these things, I think, are very, to me, sound like fascism. I don't know what they sound like to you, but they sure sound like fascism to me. And so I think we've got to wrap our heads around that, too, that we don't really live in a free country. We live in a pretend, a pretend society, a pretend democracy, and, uh, and it's, again, it's something that... Um, that as a, as a labor movement, we have to talk about it and we don't. And I don't know how we make those things happen. There was a CLC, Canadian Labor Congress, for those of you who don't know, which is you know, supposed to be the umbrella of all the, all the unions uh, in Canada. It was a convention uh, down, just down the street here in, this, in the spring. You know, uh, nine and a half hours of debate took place in an entire week. 
Uh, people or individuals are staying in hotel rooms that cost $200 a night and they don't even double up. Top of that, you get a food allowance. And we're in there listening to Wendy Mesley and Ian Hannah Manson. <laughs> right? Or Mike Carcourt. You can laugh at that one too. Um, <laughs> how's that going to move us forward? And the word capitalism is never mentioned. That entire week I didn't hear the word capitalism. Can't even name the mode of production that we're under. So the incredible resources, the incredible resources that are spent on those acts of theater uh, are, is just absolutely disgusting. And if there's any trade unionist here paying their dues, uh, that's something worth making some noise about. And that's the other way the labor movement works too, is they shut you out, they shut you down if you, if you speak out of turn in church. But I think it's time that we all start speaking out of turn. Because if we don't have those folks saying what has to be said at this point in our history, then let's just move past them, move out of the way, or we'll occupy the damn labor movement. Maybe we've got to do that. Maybe your next labor convention or, or whatever, let's occupy those and take those spaces over. Because we're being sold out here. The, Ken Giorgetti, the president of the Canadian Labor Congress, um, and I would say this to his face, by the way, too, so I don't want you to think that this isn't something that, that, uh, that we're seeing in hiding. But if you look at the, at the report, the executive report from the Canadian Labor Congress, the report was, uh, there was a glossy picture of Ken Giorgetti shaking hands with Stephen Harper in front of the G20 sign, where our own members are put in cages that were smaller than what you put out of Jaguar at the, you know, at the Toronto Zoo. They were put in cages. Our members. And this guy's shaking hands in a, in a glossy photograph of the executive report. So it's not about Ken Giorgetti, though, right? It's about a system of relations and behavior in this post-war period that labor has bought into and which we can't uh, blow, uh, we can't be a part of uh, anymore. So when we talk about occupying, let's, again, talk about more than just uh, a part. Let's build for the future, and that future is approaching fast. I don't know if we're ready for it. I don't know if we're ready for the kind of repression that's already going on with some, and will go on for a whole lot more. Because the other side knows. They know their system is crumbling. They know that they're running out of options. And they know that it's either a choice between fascism or us kicking their asses back to wherever the hell they came from. They know all that. And we're, so we're sort of just spinning our wheels in a way. Um, we gotta, we got to find a way to have those more meaningful discussions to protect each other and to change this world. There's not a lot of time left. And so again, that means occupying the land, occupying the resources, taking over the ministries. Where are the in energy sectors? Occupying the energy sectors and doing it, and doing it in a, in a way that recognizes, as, our, uh, as Arthur said, about Aboriginal title. But this, this is not something that just, you know, settlers have to, have to uh, worry about, you know, getting a better job. And it sort of disappoints me a bit when I see, and I understand it. I understand people in the Occupy movement, you know, talking about some cases, you know, uh, want a job, a better redistribution of wealth. My fear is, is they offer us some caveats. But the post office is a kind of commons. It's owned by all of us in common, and, you know, and nobody really, no one person owns it and all of that. You know, they throw us some caveats, and they throw us some more, you know, um, uh, uh, increases in public health care, whatever. We can't fall for that shit anymore. It's, it's a lot more than just getting a job and a 40 By the way, the, the, the whole notion of the 40-hour week really, it, you know, burns my ass, because, you know, I remember I was one of those kids reading in the, in the early uh, 60s, you know, yeah, I'm that old. Um, that was, uh, you're reading about the unpopular mechanics and all these magazines about the coming computer age. Did you know that we were going to have robots doing our dishes? Did you know that you, you wouldn't have to work? You'd have these endless holidays, you only have to work like three hours a day because robots would be doing anything? Well, we should ask ourselves now who's, do, who's working for who because I see people working for machines yeah. and not machines working the other way around. Well, those guys make 60, 70, 80 million dollars a year. Not to mention whatever they hide offshore through other, uh, through other means. So I wish I had more answers than questions. I wish, you know, we could say this is, this is the answer. But I think the answer is here in this room. I think the answer is out there. But we have to be able to ask ourselves those hard questions. How are we preparing for the struggle in the long term? And do our demands 
fit an, a long-term strategy, or are they sort of more instant gratification? Give us a little of this, give us a little of that. Our demands have to be much deeper, and they have to fit in to a long-term strategy in, in terms of, of actually winning, saving this planet, saving it for people that haven't even been born yet. It's a wonderful time to be alive. It's a drag that so much crap is happening around us. But it's also, we've been blessed, we've been given this period in, in time and history to make choices. And those choices are key, and the choices that we make over the next few years are going to be absolutely essential in whether we're going to turn this thing back in the long haul, or whether we're just going to have outbursts of reaction uh, against the man. A friend of mine, before I came here, um, gave me this, uh, this little bag she got uh, somewhere, and I, I think I'll just end with that and say, uh, it says, uh, Keep the faith, keep the ideals, and face the facts. Uh, thanks for having me.